Welcome back to Horses of Courses. I'm Tania. I'm Susanna. And here we are in balmy, magical Mumfordville, Kentucky on this December 3rd day. It's 28 degrees outside. And buzzards are circling us. <laughs> buzzards are circling uh, over the Save-A-Lot. So many buzzards. So many buzzards. Um, this is episode 12. And as I said, this is December 3rd, so it's actually Giving Tuesday. By the time you guys hear this, the day will have passed, but we hope you were able to give what you're able during this um, holiday season. I know this time of year, it's kind of funny because this is the biggest giving month of all year for nonprofits, but it's also the month everybody is, you know, trying to Christmas shop for their families and in theory strap for cash. I know I am. It's kind of weird that they make the Giving Tuesday in December. But I, know. I guess they think people feel more, more. They are led well, to be generous. Well, it's also because they're if you're giving, you know, large sums, and you're you're somebody who itemizes on your taxes, then you're you know usually those folks are giving that last, that last month, getting ready for for tax season coming up in January. Oh, is that what it is? That is what it is. Um, that said, a lot of people feel like. You can't give unless you are somebody who can itemize your taxes and you're in a higher income bracket. And that's not true because I want to just mention, and Susanna um, has heard me say it, and she knows it to be true, the bulk of what Heart of Phoenix accomplishes is small monthly donors. It so is. It's like the 5 to $20, five to $25 dollar dollar a month. Donor. It is the 5 to $25 dollar a month donor. And yes, we have some big donors. And yes, that allows big things at once to happen. And we are so thankful um, for those types of donors. You know, if we didn't have those kinds of givers, we couldn't have just installed the $5,000 worth of new fencing we just put in at the rescue. But the day-to-day -day things, the actual life-saving work, is really ran on the 5 to $25 a month reoccurring donor um, supporters. So I like that, though, because that means that there are a heck of a lot of people out there that believe in us and not just three big corporations. Well, it does... It does mean that, and it's a way that, you know, me sit, setting down and looking at what can we do, knowing that it's a huge collaborative giving monthly and not one or two or ten donors that can just jerk a rug out from under an operation is important, and that and I think it means um, sustainability. So we are, we are happy that that's the way um, it works, and don't feel like because you are not um, a wealthy person, you can't help. Yes, you can. Sign up to give $5 a month, $10, 20 25 Literally $5 is less. And I know this has been said by many different nonprofits over the years, but it is much less than a fancy Starbucks coffee. So think about that and decide if you're able to make that kind of commitment going into 2025. That said... We are looking toward Equine Affair in April, so we're already planning for the spring. You know what we also need to remind them about is in like less than four weeks, it's going to be time for ATFO applications for trainers to start rolling in. Right. If you are listening to this and you're a trainer or you know of a trainer or maybe you just follow a trainer online that you'd love to see in the Appalachian Trainer Face-Off, we are opening up applications, so be looking to... Uh, you know, encourage folks to apply or apply yourself. And, and, Rider Wars is coming. And I think this episode, we're going to have to mention that. And I will be doing a post. I'm working on graphics um, for that specific part of the Appalachian Trainer Face-Off. So I'll just say a little bit about it. We just had a board meeting where we hashed out the basic details. But essentially, coming for 2025, uh, thankfully... Um, 2025. Right. Five years past COVID. Ah! Gosh. <laughs> it so, sure doesn't seem like it. It doesn't. Um, but we are um, we're unveiling a program that is going to be funded in part by the ASPCA. And it's going to allow people who are not trainers, who just want to become better riders to compete. There, there should be a virtual option, and there's going to be an in-person option. So if that sounds intriguing to you, that's the, that's the only thing I'll mention right now. But it's called Rider Wars, part of the ATFO. You'll be able to apply starting January 1st, hopefully. And 
I'll be looking for a post on the Appalachian Trainer Faceoff page that gives you the details. Very excited about it. And honestly, when I posted about it, more people were excited about that than anything I've posted about um, for Hoff in years. So I hope that um, the excitement continues and we have just an incredible uh, kickoff for that this year. But Equine Affair is coming up. Susanna's never been. Have you ever been? No, I've been once. Not for, for Hop, though. No, not for Hop. Um, maybe this is the year. Maybe this is your year since you skirted out on the ATFO this year. You know, that last day. Oh, quit whining. <laughs> Susanna ran off to a, a wedding. Um, and so we she saw needs... just how valuable my presence was, didn't we? Yeah, I ran everybody off and was. It didn't go very smoothly. The live stream. The live stream. Yeah, the live stream, people were sad that Susanna was not there. I think otherwise it was okay. I don't think anything else, but I think that was that really was disappointing what, for people. That was what bothered people. Um, so maybe Susanna will, will show up for the Equine <laughs> Affair. Oh, stop it. But, but whether she does or doesn't, we will be there with bells on. Can you look up, Susanna, while, while I'm... Um, look up the dates. I but, thought you were asking me to look in the sky. I'm like, well, yeah, I can look up. <laughs> so look, well, she'll tell you the dates here in a minute. But Equine Affairs is in Columbus, Ohio. Every year it's the biggest equine event attendance-wise, I believe, in the world. Um, definitely in America. It's like fifty to 75,000 attendees. I don't know about those claims. Well, that's, that's, I think it's that's the It's one of the larger ones anyway. I think it's the largest. Look that up, too, on Google, on the Google that's box. That's your bossy today. So, she's going to look on the Google box and get that information. But we always set up there with the um, ASPCA right horse. The 10th through the 13th. April 10th through the 13th. So, we will actually set up the 9th. And we do need volunteers. So, if you're listening to this, um, it does take... Uh, you know, 10 plus people at least to pull it off. Many people just stop in and volunteer for the day and help us with the booth or do stalls or feed. We try to take between three to six horses. And we have been thinking about the horses that will go up there. Actually, the horse of the month. Quarter or, Horse Congress is the largest equine event. Is it? But it goes on for weeks and weeks, I think, is why, doesn't it? The Devon Horse Show, the Kentucky Derby, the Quarter Horse Association Convention, and then Equine Affair. So it's like fifth. Oh. Well, yeah, Kentucky Derby has like 80,000 people to attend. But you just made things up. I've that's read what you that. Did. Oh, yeah. That. I was giving in your dream that's last what I've night. Read. I've read that. Um, so the um, Horse of the Month, she if she's not adopted, now we're trying to encourage adoption. Are you going out of order now? No, no. I'm just mentioning we're going to be taking the horse of the month to the equine affair. Okay. Um, we're going to encourage adoption of that horse. But I am um, I'm hoping that uh, we will have at least four horses that will go up, whatever horses those end up being, because you don't know who will be adopted between now and then. But we are um, we're looking forward to that this year. Diana who is in our, who's one of our board members. She will be back. Yay. Running that event smoothly. We were glad that Brittany could, could help last year and she got it going, but it's been Diana's event for years, so we're glad she'll be back. So definitely plan to come up there and see us and lend a hand if you can. It's a wonderful adoption event. We get horses, um, especially young horses, adopted there. Mm -hmm. Or horses that need a higher level rider adopted there a lot easier because you do have experienced horse people coming through. And um, I just think it's a wonderful event for exposure and so forth. That said, I'm going to let Susanna run with this topic. I have some thoughts, but she's got a lot more to say on our kind of horse ailment this month. And we're going to go with botulism. Botulism. Boy, I had a tragic episode with botulism. So there are two ways to get botulism, two common ways to get botulism. One is from dead animals being bailed in your hay. And the other one, which is really prevalent here in Kentucky, is soil-carried botulism. And the soil-carried botulism is the one that I had a run-in with. I lost a beautiful... Um, two-week-old foal to soil-carried soil botulism. And the thing is that was so sad is my veterinarian had said, listen, they sent UK around and every farm that they pulled soil samples from, 
uh, I think it was like 81% of them had soil carried botulism and she said with the way the weather patterns are changing that's coming to the top and we're losing more and more horses to botulism and they have developed a vaccine that is really helpful for that and you really should think about giving it to your horses. Well, I believed her and I was going to, but it was one of those things where I was going to the next time she came out. And so my daughter's horse had a foal, and that's a long story. We didn't breed the horse. Somebody stole her and bred her, but anyway. Had a foal, beautiful foal. Before you all had the horse. Yeah, before we had her. Yeah, they stole from the uh, original owner. Yeah, they stole her and secretly bred her. And the foal was born at my house. Beautiful, healthy foal. Lovely, giant, beautiful filly. And when she was two weeks old, I went out that morning to feed, and she was stuck underneath the fence. And I was like fussing and cussing and like, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? So I drug her out and she couldn't get up. Well, at first we thought that she just had like her limbs had fallen asleep because she'd been stuck long enough. But she couldn't get up and she couldn't get up. She got up and she sat down like Bambi. And then we called the vet and I told the vet that she sat down like Bambi. And the vet said a cuss word and came flying out. And she had gotten soil carried botulism and we had to euthanize her because e even as the vet was there, she just kept shutting down. First her tail wouldn't move and then she couldn't get up at all and then her mouth stopped working and we put her to sleep. And it was the saddest thing. And if I had had the mare with her series of three for the botulism, we probably wouldn't have lost that foal. She might have gotten sick, but we probably could have pulled her through it. So, but the misnomer is, is that the botulism vaccine will protect your horse from the um, animals bailed in the hay that are dead and it will not give them 100% protection. It will give them a better chance of surviving that but it's not actually meant for that type of botulism because there's like botulism A and botulism C and I never can remember which is which. So that one will give them some, some limited value in that they're more likely to survive the um, botulism from dead animals but it is really meant for soil carried botulism and is much more effective for that type of botulism. Well and so I want to mention and I, I won't you know I don't have the statistics but is my understanding that it's generally thought that botulism is not something a horse can recover from. It doesn't mean it's never happened but generally. Well we had the one that did it. Well that's what I was going to say. He didn't I don't know that it was ever verified no, that he wrote. The, the mini. Oh, that's right. Well, there are two then. So, yeah. the, so, so keep in mind, like, I wouldn't even recommend people generally try based on what I understand. It's very unlikely. Jelly and, bean. And for them to not, right. Um, so, jelly bean was a, a mini or kind of a small Shetland pony. Shetland pony, yeah. That uh, the adopter um, got through botulism. It was extraordinarily it was hard. Rough. It was hard to watch. It was rough on, it, um, but she has no lasting effects, but gosh, she suffered for weeks. Yes, and so I will say, I will say on my end, that is not something that at Heart of Phoenix we would do. We understand adopters or owners personally feel differently. Um, well, and she was a nurse, so she could start the IVs and things right. herself, so it saved her a lot of money to be able to do those right. kinds of things at home, but still. But, but for us, like, I, I have very, like, you know, that length of time of what an animal goes through, it, it's, it would be something I wouldn't myself do. But um, that did succeed. The, the little horse is alive now, and there was... And fine. She's fine. And she's fine. It seems to have no lasting effects, but also Hero who was in the ATFO in 2018, maybe, or 2018, 2019, um, the vet suspected botulism. I don't think it was ever confirmed. And he's a, you know, a full-size, I mean, he's a pony, but, I mean, he's a full, full-size full pony. And um, they got him through it. And the, as best as all the symptoms um, and diagnostics that I they don't were think doing. his was so severe, though, because he didn't, like, lay there in a coma and have to be propped up with no, straw. No, his like was, Jay I do not did. think his was near as severe. But, but, so we do know of two equines that have, have got, gotten through botulism, but I think the general consensus is it's not survivable. That always, of course, with a grain of salt, there are some, but my, my point was, when you all euthanize the fall, that's absolutely what should have happened. Well. You shouldn't have drug, yeah. drug that out, you know, um, and sometimes, uh, people, they end up thinking, oh, maybe, oh, well, no, and uh, we lost, um, a, we had an adopter that um, adopted um, that little gray buckshot. 
Yeah, both he of ended up going to Ohio State, mm-hmm. and they lost him to botulism. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's it's becoming more and more common. I have lost a goat to botulism mm-hmm. uh, years ago. And the so, soil carried one is really ramping up because I mean that de- the dead animal one it is what it is. You bale hay, you're going to get some dead animals. Well, and the reason we thought about talking on botulism right now specifically was because in the winter round bales are fed more frequently, right. and we do use round bales. Um, it's it's a word of caution to who and where you source them from, but there's just nothing to be done. There could be. I mean, a dead is, fawn or mouse. rat or mouse. Yeah. There could be a dead animal, no matter how diligent your hay person is, in your hay. Frankly, it could be in your square bales. And if you feed oh, them I whole. I found them in my square bales. Well, and so, I mean, if you feed them whole, then, you know, like as we do, like we'll put a whole bale, take the strings off in a, um, a huge uh, hay net. So there is a little bit of risk, you know, with square bales, but certainly much more um, with, with round bales. Because you aren't out there looking at them. And most people are feeding parts of, of square bales where we do feed most of them whole. So I found I found whole fawns, snakes, mice, rats, But turtles. the thing that, the, that my vet has said is that unless your horse is absolutely, star, you know, not starving, but like ravenously hungry, they can smell that botulism and they right. won't eat that part. So, right. so a lot of times you're running into... People who put their hay out there and they're like, well, I'm not replacing that until I eat that one. And sometimes, you know, most of the time with horses, if they're not eating it, there is a reason why they're not eating it. Either Mm -hmm. they consider it too moldy or there's botulism in it. And that's where you get into trouble is if, well, I'm not putting out anything else until that one's all gone. Well, and I, and I have to remind myself of that because sometimes out in the big field, I'll be like, well, they're not eating that one. No, I'm not going to have them put out all new hay. They're still this. And then after, there's a reason they're not eating it. There's Um, a reason. You know, there is. And so, because we do feed round bales um, at the the rescue in in the big feeders, and um, the story the story is that um, West Virginia doesn't test the soils don't test as carrying um, botulism. It's creeping up there. But though. yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you know, I can't see why eventually it wouldn't be there. So that's something um, just to keep in mind if you want to do the vaccines, if you want to be more cautious with with the hay that you're feeding, just be aware. And then, Susanna, go back over the signs with them that you saw or what you know to be maybe an adult horse so that if they run into it, they know they know what to, you know, to get on the phone with their vet and say, hey, I, you know, I have an emergency. Well, that Bambi sitting is actually one of the one of the hallmark signs, but also your the tail not being moving. So, or no resistance in the tail. If you go to pick the tail up and they don't try to keep, you know, a lot of, most of the time if you try to pick a horse's tail up, they immediately try to clamp it back to themselves. So no resistance in the tail are the, are the two first signs. And then it just crashes from there. Well, and we want to, um, we want to hope you never run into it. I sure hope I never run into it again. But But so anyway, we're going to hope you don't run into that. Yeah. It's really cold out here. There's another thing Susanna wants to share with you that she loves so much. I do love this. A long time ago, I can't remember what year it was, we had to go up to northern West Virginia in December to do animal control officer and sheriff training at a barn that didn't have a heated arena. And I was like, all right, that's it. I've been eyeballing these heated vests. I'm going to buy me one because I can't be out in this in December and teach with any kind of sense with my teeth chattering. So I'm gonna buy me a heated vest. So I bought a Herrero heated vest. And I think this is going on either the seventh or the eighth winter that I've had it. And I absolutely love it. And I tell all of my horsey friends to get an Herrero heated vest. You have to recharge the batteries. They're fantastic. They've got a high and a low setting. And on the high setting, my battery lasts about three hours and I have a backup battery so I can be out about six hours with my vest on. And I just absolutely love my vest. And I'm super cheap and (laughs) I have like an off brand one. And I bought the caretakers last year at the rescue, some off brand ones and they do cost less, but I can't tell you that they work long term because nobody's used them at the length. Susanna has used the Aurora and that is, I think the better reviewed vest 
on Amazon. And I'm telling you now, when I say I use it, it gets used every day. Like, Susanna will use it in the summer. Yeah, I will use it in the summer. <laughs> you know, it's not like, oh, well, she just uses it occasionally. And I'm like, she will have it on in July because why, Susanna? Because well, I'm in a restaurant and I'm cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, but to be fair, I had a double mastectomy and they took my whole chest off and that I does make me colder. I think you might have worn it before that happened. Well, not as summer. much. <laughs> I'm but colder she, now. She has hardly hardly used it and what do they run like cost wise you reckon you know i when i back when i bought mine it was like 114 dollars with the battery but i think they've gone up because everything's gone up so i don't right. really know what they run anymore so if you want to if you want right now during this month i think in december you can find you know deals on amazon if you're saying hey i don't want to spend that much i don't know that i'll like it or you can ask for it from santa claus yeah santa might bring you one santa's brought me a spare battery before santa baby i really need an aurora heated vest or two <laughs> or two or <laughs> two batteries and i'm sure they probably i saw now they make like sole inserts for oh, your yeah, boots. aurora has all, all they have gloves. a heated scarf a heated hat heated gloves socks, socks. Yeah, so that can make your life less miserable. We were out today doing horse things here. By in, golly, I was wearing mine, too. She was wearing hers. I didn't hey, have the mine. the vet tech had one on, too, and hers was an Aurora. Yeah, I, I just had layers, but... Um, That's O-R-O-R-O. We may not be pronouncing O-R-O-R-O. it right. O-R-O-R-O. O-R-O-R-O. That's like E-I-E-I-O, but different. O-R-O-R-O. So that's our, that's our product that we're, we're pushing this month. We're an unsponsored, so don't worry. Yeah. We're, uh, not, we're not getting any free stuff. But if Aurora would like to sponsor us, that'd be fantastic. Well, that would be. Wouldn't that be great? Then I'd know what a name brand one's like. Well. I know. got mine on like Walmart clearance. Of course you did. For like $18 in the hunting section. I don't hunt, so I was just, I don't even know, I was looking at clearance things. And Listen, you not only do you not hunt, but you won't even plug your daggone battery in so you can use your I don't even know where the battery is now, so that's the hard the hard thing for me that was keeping up with useful. the battery. <laughs> um, so, our horse of the month, our horse of the month is Dawn. Dawn. Dawn, who will be at the Equine Affair in April if she's not adopted, because that's a great venue for adopting babies out. I think she'll be three in April or May, too. Well, well, and if she's not adopted, then she'd go in the ATFO. Yeah, let me right. see. Right. I think she's going to be three in April or May. So, um, she is, she's, I think, always been a pretty good baby. She's cute. She's built nice. She's kind of quarter horsey. She's kind of unflappable. Yeah, got a good mind. Um, just a solid baby, uh, mm -hmm. solid young horse. Guess really not a baby now, but solid young horse. If you're looking for a horse that's being handled and brought along nicely, she's her foster has done a nice job with oh, every. She doesn't turn three till the end of May. Okay. Yeah, but she, I mean, her foster's done a really nice job with her, and she's always been handled. You know, she was born at. Um, well, no, we got her when she was probably eight weeks old, mm -hmm. but she's been handled at the rescue. She was handled with, throughout the time she was with Susanna as a foster, and then she She was went, 14 hands last time she was sticked, which was back in August. Um, so just a solid little, little pony size, like quarter pony. Yeah. So look her up on My Right Horse, if you go to myrighthorse.org. I like a lovely bay. I like bays. I She's mean, got a teeny tiny little star. Like, it's so tiny in the middle of her forehead. A good horse is no bad color, though. That's true. I like black horses. But whatever. I like black horses, too. But yeah, I have horses. bays, so. <laughs> but uh, mine chestnut. are gray. Mine are gray, so. And I don't like gray. I don't prefer that color. But you can go to myridehorse.org and then um, find Heart of Phoenix and find her listing there. Or you can go to WV. Um, horserescue.org and go to the adopt page and you can read about Dawn. You can also do hashtag hop team Dawn and there are some posts of, about her online and just a, a nice little solid horse if you want to bring a horse um, She'll do up herself. She'll do obstacles and a little bit of lunging because we don't like lunging a lot for young horses. Actually we don't like lunging a lot anyway. I don't like lunging a lot anyway. Um, so she's looking for a home. If not you can meet her at Equine Affair. If not 
Um, we'll see on the ATFO. We won't put them in until they're three, but we have allowed horses to go in for ground stuff and be started later on if the horse has a good mind. So we'll, we'll see how she is, depending if she's still available. Up next is my favorite part. That's your favorite? Maybe. I mean, sometimes when we have a good ding -a -ling. Yeah. And well, this... Is there such a thing as a good ding -a <laughs> They're the ding -a because they're not good. I know. But like a really dingy ding -a, a dingy ding -a <laughs> <laughs> We have a really dingy ding -a That one dings a lot. So, this one... You can ring my bell. <laughs> <laughs> this one is... This has happened a lot, and it's not just one person, but this specifically is was a single person this doing something we've heard a lot, which is when we mention arthritis. I have to, arthritis, and I'm fine. I have arthritis, and I'm fine. Okay, well, arthritis isn't fine. I know people crippled by arthritis. I know people who have joints replaced because of arthritis. I know people who choose to not be physically active because of it, that choose not to uh, um, go out and do things with, with their friends and family because of it. I know people who are bedridden because of it. So keep that in mind. When your horse is diagnosed with arthritis, it's a big deal. I know people with arthritis that tell me that their pain on a scale of 1 to 10 is a 9 every day. Well, but Terry they, says, my And they husband. get up, right, and he gets up and he moves around and does things because he has to. Because he has to. He has to. And he learns to deal with it because what choice does he have? Yeah, but shoot, every day it's, oh, I wish my neck would stop hurting. Oh, my neck. I got to go lay down. My neck is hurting so bad. My and neck so, is giving me a headache. So what I wanted to to kind of bring up about horses and why I think it's so much worse for a horse. When you look at the skeletal system of a horse, their bones, especially you're talking about, say, an 800-pound horse, which is seven times the size of Susanna weight-wise. <laughs> but if you look at the joints of a horse, say the knee joint of a horse, it is no bigger than your knee, the actual knee joint. If you would take your knee and put it next to a thoroughbred's knee. I thought you were going to say and put it in a horse. Like, That'd be weird. <laughs> it's no bigger. So imagine if uh, when you have human beings with arthritis in their knees to the point that they are crippled and have to have the joint replaced. And they weigh 160 pounds or in your case 118 pounds. What about when you have a joint no bigger supporting a horse that weighs seven times that? How much more excruciating is that for the horse? And we just go, oh, it's just arthritis. There was a vet once that somebody had bought this horse, and we, we shared about this on the Heart of Phoenix page. And we um, the, the lady had, had bought this horse. It was her first horse. She was very excited. Had a horse trader, a sketchy horse trader in Logan, West Virginia, who does this to people all the time. Sold her a horse. Not only was the horse blind, and she didn't know, but the horse was riddled with arthritis. And the first vet that she had examined the horse just said, oh, it's nothing to worry about. It's just arthritis. When she reached out to us for help because she felt like the horse was not doing well and she didn't get the right diagnostics and brought it to um, the rescue for our vet at Equine Medical Center to see the horse. He's like, well, your horse is riddled with arthritis. She said, but wait, it's just arthritis. That's what the other vet told me. He goes, honey, there's no such thing as just arthritis. In a horse... Just arthritis, that's, that's, that doesn't happen. It's arthritis, and it's degenerative, and it's chronic, and it ultimately becomes very painful. Now, how rapidly that moves and how manageable it is, those are, those are gray areas. But I have very few people x-ray their horses like we do. I mean, we take x-rays constantly, and I have seen what can happen in a 12-month period of time in a joint that had what we would call minor arthritis and in a year it'd be horrifying so you know I don't want to scare you away from horses with arthritis I want you to have realistic expectations it can go very slow it can be managed in some horses for a certain amount of time that's all I mean it just that's why you misusing a young horse is a bad idea it's why doing certain types of competitions without proper conditioning doing it well it's why your farrier is so daggone important. It's why your farrier is important. Because if you set your important. feet up with long toe, no heel, you are putting so much wear and tear on a horse's knee and shoulder. 
And, and people just don't understand that with the long toe, no heel. It's so much wear and tear on a knee and a shoulder. And I do, and so there are elements where you can control it, but there are genetic factors that make it beyond your control, which we just ran into with basil. Yeah. We just had to put basil to sleep. And this comment was made um, in relation to um, us saying that the arthritis was a factor. He was eight years old and had arthritis all through the, I mean he had arthritis in the neck in the first vertebrae there, there was arthritis and then in compressed disc C3 and C4 was compressed C4 and C5 was compressed and C5 and C6 was compressed and you think about Susanna Sharon her husband being miserable every day with with arthritis and he's already even had surgery to try to correct it and, and it, it did is, for a while but right. they told him it would fail eventually and so you think about a horse, the size of the horse, the amount of vertebrae in the neck. Um, well, I mean, the, we, we saw personality change out of him. Well, you could see the movement, the personality change. But somebody just, why would you put him down for just arthritis? He has good days. <laughs> wild stuff. But so, then you'd do his farrier work and he'd stand like a goat on a rock for two days. And that's just not fair. Well, and we don't, and you don't know how much they learn to hide. There's a point where horses... And this goes into what is our main topic. And, mm -hmm. you know, we can probably just roll it on in. Horses can hide things, and also people don't look enough to even get the answers. And I've read something. Um, Grace Keaton, who does uh, a very particular type of body work, works on Warwick Schiller's horses. Um, she shared something that had been written on some page on Facebook, and it said, You can never rule out equine pain. You can never rule it out. You can never say for 100%. You can say I've done the diagnostics available to me. You can say I'm not seeing the signs of pain. You can never rule out equine pain. Well, I mean, we've had horses past lamenesses that it's like, yeah, but something's still wrong. But something's wrong. wrong. Um, well, but the computer says he's sound. Well, okay, but something's still something's wrong. Something's still wrong. And so that rolls into... Um, and this is that's not entirely what this next topic's about, but it rolls into... We want to tell you the truth about the horses that end up in auctions, that ultimately are purchased by broker lots, broker scams, sometimes called kill pens, the truth about those horses. And as, as usual, Susanna has taken many a call on, on the subject. So before I even go on to my soapbox about it, Susanna can tell you some of the calls, or if one particular call stands out recently, um, about... The kinds of horses ending up in these sales, the kinds of people buying them, and then the calls we get about them. Well, the, the one that stands out the most recently was this lady called, and she purchased a horse from a from a broker lot in Texas. I can't even remember which one she said. And had it hauled to New York. And when it got to her in New York, she was like, well, this horse wasn't honestly represented, and it had a, um, it had a tear can't think of what the tear was but it's one that we've tried to rehabilitate before and not had any success with I can't even remember deep digital flexor tendon tear but a really significant one and they had already spent a year and thirty thousand dollars trying to fix this deep digital flexor tendon tear and she's called and wanted to know if we would take him and let him live a happy life and I'm like well, no, ma'am. We would take him and put him to sleep, but I was just like, what's he like now? Well, he has some days where he hurts, and I'm, and I'm like, ma'am, he already made a very painful trip from Texas to New York, and that, you know, you didn't know. And she said, no, he wasn't honestly represented at all. They said it was a minor injury that just needed eight weeks to heal. <laughs> because broker lots <laughs> honestly represent horses, you know. <laughs> very, very rarely. And so, and I'm like, and now you want to put him on a trailer from New York to West Virginia? I said, that wouldn't be very fair. And she was like, well, I only have three acres. I can't put him out here. And I'm like, well, you just need to put him to sleep. And she's like, but he hasn't even had a chance to have a happy life. He's been on box rest for a year. And I'm like, well, 
So put him out for a day and then put him to sleep. But it just, it went on and on. I did finally get her to understand that that would be mean to ship him when he's in pain from New York to West Virginia. And that that would be what we were going to do. We would get him and we would confirm the diagnosis and we would put him to sleep and not let him have a year as, of as we should. in the field. Yeah. And that's what should have been done. So, so, I mean, those calls are so hard because these people, I mean, she... $30,000 plus whatever she paid for him, plus whatever she paid to quarantine him, plus whatever she paid to ship him. And to line the pockets of a dishonest criminal type of business. Also, the, all the money to pay for him, they always usually run the quarantines and the shipping, you know. But, we've we've ranted about that before. But, It's that, hard because these people are just bawling. And yeah. they're like, I just wanted to do a good thing. And, and it's it's just such a fine line with... Well, next time, help a rescue, a reputable rescue. Right. That'll do it a good thing. And 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 so the number of messages that come in via email, the calls that Susanna gets, the number of messages to the hot page that start with, I got this horse from a kill. I saved. I saved. I saved this. rescued or I saved. I saved this horse from a kill pen. And here's what's wrong with the horse. I can't keep it. I didn't know this was what was wrong with it. Right. So part one. Never for any reason purchase a horse ever from a broker lot or kill pin scheme. They are, they're, they're, they're scams. Number two, if you do, be prepared for the horse to have many, many issues. That is why they're there. The horse trading and horse sales business, it's a business and it's a big business. And the people that are actively buying and reselling animals without issues horses without issues. They know what they're doing. If the horse ends up in one of these broker scams called kill pins, you know, kill pins, they're not really kill pins, but when they end up in those, there is something wrong. Now, it may be behavioral just because the horse was mishandled. The horse may physically not have significant issue. The horse may um, the horse may have had so many training disasters that the, now the horse's mind is blown. Or the horse has a significant physical issue, or the horse has a, a physical issue nobody has found the root cause of that is correctable. Those are the four options I have found in the, the systems. The fifth one being feral, just feral. Okay, that we can deal with. We don't deal with um, or accept horses directly from kill pen scams. When I say, I, I mean kill pen, anything that says kill pen is a scam. So we don't accept horses from those situations. However, that doesn't mean we haven't received horses that have been in those situations. Because when you get these calls like Susanna's sharing, that horse is now out of that situation and now an owner's surrender. And we do accept owner's surrenders and we don't do it always. But there are instances where People have reached out many, many times, and ultimately what we find out is the horse came from a kill pen scheme. Well, that's how we got Genevieve and Dawn. And, and that's uh, how Dawn, who we talked Danica, about this month, her yeah. mother um, her mother had a twisted foot. She was never going to be sound. She had a twisted coffin bone. Twisted, like, you know, so she was never going to be okay. Guinevere, it's hard to say what all was wrong, but she was, you know, entirely emaciated and on the decline. Now, the babies were unhandled, but, but they ended up okay, but they sold on the sides of their mothers because they were so young when they went through. But Don's foot wanted to twist like Danica's. Because and the she had the genetic issue. Was that we had good farrier care. And, and that is why the mayor had been discarded at, from being a brood mare, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So understand when you're purchasing these horses, the people selling them to you are in it for the money. And they're already lying to you saying these horses are ready to ship to slaughter when they're not. Um, they're already greatly inflating the price. They're, everything they're telling you is a lie. Um, we had that poor little Grula, Henderson. Yeah. He ended up going to a rescue that had gotten him from one of those scams, and they turned him and some others over to us after the fact when they couldn't provide the care that these horses needed. Henderson ended up having a dislocated stifle that would lock temporarily and then unlock at, at Liberty, you know, just, just randomly, and it would just totally dislocate. 
and they rode him through bucking you're cracking me up because you're you're gesturing on yourself where these problems are like they can see this. oh like they can see like it was She's here like putting it's her it's hand his back hip. on her hip <laughs> it was his hip um <laughs> it was actually She's like twisting her yeah. arm and all kinds yeah. of crazy gyrations over here. <laughs> she thinks she's on television. Yeah, I need to film this. Um <laughs> so you know, he was he was one that came through that that was was sold as rideable and not rideable. Every I mean, I don't know, we've probably had a hundred or so come through that have originally been in these situations and we get them after the fact. Not one of them ever has not needed incredible training and or diagnostics. And the bulk have needed euthanasia. The bulk have needed euthanasia. So understand that. And here's the thing. Because I can hear the minds of people who want to defend what they do and make it okay. Because that's what people do. You probably haven't done the diagnostics we would do and are ignoring things we wouldn't if you haven't discovered that in a horse that you've gotten from one of those things. Well, I mean, if you can, have one. We can go back to that because, you know, Basil was on that equinosis machine and came out sound, but then he he just kept deteriorating, had to go to Haggard and have neck x-rays to figure but, it out. But, but, and Basil didn't come from one of those situations. No, However, but it speaks to, here's the thing, how much we had already put into getting him okay, how much we looked into diagnostics, and that what you sent me when I saw it, when it changed, I was like, oh, do you know how many people would have ignored that? Yeah. People who, there are people that currently consider themselves upper level horse people who would have, who would have considered him okay. Because they, because we have, because it is easier to ignore the, the little signs and pretend it's not there but we won't do that. And so I think it's why we have that information of what the truth is about the horses going through these situations. Because who else would work that hard and see the little things that lead to the big diagnosis? And so if you're willing to ignore what the horse is telling you, you might convince yourself that that horse you got from the kill pin scam that's actually navicular and hurting every day is fine. I know people that do that. I saw a Facebook meme that I I shared on the hop page, and I really liked it. It was it was a cartoon. It was these two girls going, I sure wish horses could talk. And then on the bottom picture, the horse was swinging around trying to bite him while they were girthing him up. And it's like, they do talk. They just don't speak English. Well, but, but I will say that I do think if you... If you're fortunate, the horse is telling you. But there are horses that just learn just to, go to hide it, it and go on. Yeah. And there are horses that learn to hide it and go on. And and I've heard those horses, they're, they're tough. Yes, they are. And honestly, those horses, if you're doing everything you can, you're getting chiropractic and your, your farrier is doing excellent work and you've got the horse on, you know... Um, a good program where it's in, in movement that's developing the body and teaching the horse to carry itself better and you've got the horse on, you know, Equiox, then there's there's a point where you have serviceably sound, but you need to be real honest about what is serviceably sound. And there are a lot of horses, and my vet and I have had this conversation, that aren't serviceably, be, serv serviceably sound that people are riding and calling them fine. We get videos. There are videos we get sent where the horse is dead lame, and I, I ask, "Do you have you wondered if something's going on?" I don't oh, see anything. Seems, seems fine. My vet, Doctor Walker, once told me it's hard for him to go to a horse show because eighty percent of the horses he sees shown are extremely lame. Well, my farrier says it's hard to go to a horse show because eighty percent of the horses that she sees are operating in pain from the shape their feet are in. Well, and all that. So I mean. You know, and again, I, I I hate to just like throw everything down in the trash can, but we can do better. And if, and if we are seeing this, then we need to tell you th to do better. And this may not apply to you, but it probably applies to somebody you know. And you can't just run up to somebody and body and be, it's like beat on them and be like, hey, your horse, your horse is in pain. But you can do you, yourself. You can have a, you know, represent a better example. You can talk about it when it's relevant to the conversation and and it, o over time people do make changes i have seen people make changes and it doesn't mean we don't miss it sometimes i have gone back and been like how did i miss that you know how did i miss that about a horse um i hold my own self accountable so it's not like i, I want to hold the public accountable 
but also my own self. And we I know can, Susanna I mean, we wants can't to. be perfect about it because there's there's just so complex. But I mean, if some I don't know, if something's consistently off, something's wrong. And just because everything says no, it's all fine, that just means that it's missed. Well, and and just because you can't afford the diagnostics doesn't mean there's not something to find. Right. It costs a lot of money to do and it takes a good vet. It takes a good vet and a good farrier, and everybody doesn't have an unlimited pocketbook. And I'm not saying we have an unlimited one. We have resources and, and um, you know, have learned enough to kind of pinpoint things a little, a little quickly and find the answer more often than maybe some folks. But, you know. Well, we're getting better at giving our vets clues, too. Like, I, you know, Dr. Freeland, I can be like, listen, he consistently stands with this left hind forward, so it's something around here. Yeah. But it actually ended up being up in his neck, right? Well, that, but that wasn't tells for you. Him. That was oh, it wasn't Basil. Else. Oh, yeah. but Basil was standing, camped under himself yes. in the back end. But the issue was in the neck. Yes. So I mean, that's another thing is just understanding where how many horses I've seen that are navicular, that what you see is hind end lameness because the hind end is carrying more, like they're all they're compensating and putting trying to like project weight to the back, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, you know, because it's hurting on the front. So there's just different things over time and every horse isn't the same, but I would just encourage people to, to really take to heart that you can never rule out pain. And so don't convince yourself when the diagnostics or the x-rays, because somebody made that same comment, well, just because the x-rays say no, that's exactly just because the x-rays say that I know that's happened. I don't need, it's not just because in, in a flippant way. Well, just because the x-rays say that it doesn't mean, yes, it does. It does actually mean that. Yes, it does. <laughs> well, I mean, now, in Basil's case, he had to have 50, I think it was 50 millimeters of space in his, in his cervical spaces for the spinal cord not to be compressed. And they were 44, 44 and 40, 47, I think. So, yeah. And there are instances where, you know, um, things confuse or whatever, you know, but, but also I don't want to put a horse through what can take a very long time and then things never actually fuse. Like in ring bone horses, um, or people, you know, so just, just take it seriously that, um, if you're going to, if you're going to make the decision to fund kill pin schemes, then when you receive a horse, expect it to be an extensive complicated. veterinary complicated veterinary and training endeavor be willing to put the money in that is now your responsibility do the right thing if euthanasia is what the horse needs then be willing to do that it's so frustrating when they when the the, the calls that frustrate me or when they call and they're like this is what we found and i can't afford to do anything about it can you take them and i'm like well, you brought them home, so put them to sleep. Right. Oh, I just can't. I it can't. would hurt my feelings. Yeah. You don't reckon it hurts my feelings? Reckon it hurts my... I have to put a lot more horses to sleep than you, Joe Schmo. Hurts <laughs> my feelings, you know? And, and here's the well, thing. Well, you know what hurts my feelings more is these ones that they just come in, and we know that we have to put them to sleep, and it's like, here they are with nobody they know, and... You made this big long trailer the trip. The trailering trip. And they the, don't know us. That this big long me. trailer trip. And, and the, the new environment. The new environment. They don't know any horses there. And then, bam, we kill them. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it is sad. And, and here's the thing. I'm glad that we can do it and we will do it. And I, and I will keep doing it until, until I'm no more. I will do it. But if you are who gets the horse, you should be who does it. You should be who does. If you cannot, cannot, then okay. You know, we will do it. Um, I think the greatest thing that, that Heart of Phoenix honestly has ever done is being willing to stand in the gap for the horses that need euthanasia and do it. And I have not ever let the court of, of silly rose-colored glass wearing public opinion influence that. But, but I do have enough sense to say, you know, the public is accountable for the animals they own. Um, if, if you get the horse and it needs euthanasia, then you should be who does it. Yeah. You shouldn't make the horse have all these changes the last minute, you know. And I've had people say, though, but you guys do this sort of thing all the time, so it doesn't bother you. Yeah, it bothers the hell out of me. Yeah, like, here's, here's the example. And, I mean, people have used this comparison 
for lots of things. You have a cup, right? So you, when you do something like that, it sucks. So you pour a little bit of water in the cup. Well, what if you have to do it all the time? And the water eventually pours out of the cup. And that's how you burn good, good organizations and good rescues out, you know. I mean, there have certainly been, Susanna's been on the phone with me um, when I've been at the landfill, which is where, you know, horses that are euthanized with a euthanol, um, euthasol, that's where, you know, these days we take them and it's the most ethical, uh, safe way of disposal and um, economical type of disposal. I've been on the phone. I, I hate doing this. Like, I don't like this. Um, but somebody has to do it. And so and so we will. And it's not that we won't. But, but try to be responsible. And if you hear somebody having these conversations where it's like they want to put their obligation from that they've, you know, got themselves entangled in from some kill pen scheme. And they get a horse. It's not what they said. Not represented. Oh, it's supposed to be 12. It's 32. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, what do you expect, honey? There are good places to source horses. You can adopt from an ethical rescue. You can certainly buy. There are there are good horse trainers out there that sell horses and honestly represent them. We work with, yeah. we work with uh, trainers that do a good job. Um, the funny thing is, is she spent... She spent, I don't know, let's call it $40,000 trying to turn this horse around and make it something she could use when she could have gone to Brenda Hansen and bought one for 6000 Right. That would have been and, a nice and horse. And put money in the pocket of a good, hard-working horsewoman instead of a criminal organization like the broker lot. And so it's that's... It's crazy. It's just, it's just I mean, stuff. kudos to her for being committed to spend that much money trying to fix him once she had him. And she did ultimately euthanize him. She did. Yes. Uh, okay, yes. She did ultimately euthanize him. And I, and that was good. And that's a hard lesson. It's not, you know, I have learned lessons in similar hard, not for $40,000, but, <laughs> I, you know, I don't have $40,000, but but I have learned lessons where if I told the story, it would sound like I that was just as big of a what in the world moment. And We've so you, made mistakes. you learn better and you do better. And I, I think that that lady will have learned and she finally did the right thing. And so, but there are people who don't ultimately do the right thing. And so I'm glad that woman did. So the moral of the story is, you know, if you get entangled in something like that, then ex it, be expecting there to be an issue. And here's the thing. Don't be somebody who reaches out to me and says, well, you know, I got me a horse from one of them kill pen schemes, and it's just sounding fine. I bet you if you'd bring it to Heart of Phoenix and we'd look it over, we'd find the issue. Because there is one. There is one. There just is. Unless you got a feral, and then the issue was it was feral. <laughs> so, I mean, you can fix that, and that's fixable, you know, usually. Sometimes you it's know. stallion. Yeah. So, um, but but so far in in my history, and this also goes to just horses at low-end auctions, Um and I've grew up in them, so I've seen more than probably anybody listening uh, go through low end auctions, and that's the kind of horse that goes to the kill pin schemes. There's something, so and it doesn't mean it's not fixable, but there is something, and uh, otherwise you're you're ignoring something, and your horse is, you know, got some kind of pain or some kind of issue. You probably you're just uh, putting in the back of your head, or you haven't even discovered. So be keep looking because the horse deserves for anything it has going on to be fixed if it can be and to get some kind of resolution. So I'm big on that. Like I want I want the horse to have a kind, decent outcome. So, all righty, that's it. This is our 12th episode. We've done one year of podcasts. One year, one year of yakking at people. One year, and we still have things to say. Can you believe it? Uh, do we I actually can. Like things? we don't run out of things <laughs> to say. Things. Uh, so, all right, I don't know. Um, we're gonna do a few changes, maybe moving into maybe the second year. Maybe we'll do some guests. I don't know. Maybe we'll have some guests sometimes. I like guests. Yeah. Let somebody else talk at them for a little while. Talk at the people. Yeah. Well, I want to appreciate, uh, tell you all how much I appreciate y'all listening. I think we have, um, I think our first episode has almost 200 in unique uh, listeners. And I mean, for a year of, of podcasting, we've not sponsored any posts. We haven't done anything big with it. We wanted to make sure we had like 12 episodes in before we really started trying to um, run with it bigger so that if somebody comes and finds the, the podcast, they've got plenty of stuff to listen to um, right off the bat. So hopefully bigger and better in 2025. And so until next time, I'm Tania. I'm Susanna. And that's Horses of Courses.